come to some kind of conclusion this is something we do every single day and we've been taught to do and we evaluate the global appreciation test this particular talk was a talk uh, Maureen and I gave uh, in February to Wim Alberts' session at um, University of Johannesburg and it's attended by quite senior people from our competitors in fact I think Gerard also gave a talk there um, We've got senior academics there, we had some judges there, and we had the Registrar of Trademarks. And that was the question that I posed to them for this particular talk. And to some extent, I'm going to explain why. So if you just put them on reading that. It was a bit quick. I'll take it again, because I understand that there might be a delay also down in the, in the branch offices. So that's a question posed by our Star Wars character for the day, Yoda. And that leads quite nicely onto the next slide, because whilst the global appreciation test in Europe looks, feels and sounds the same as the South African test, it is applied very differently. And I take this from my own experience, having left South Africa in 1998, Travelling across, I did already by that stage got four years under my belt and passed the practitioners and thought I was a superhero and arrived at a yoga class dressed in Yoda pants. And for quite some time, I felt like that chap wearing Yoda pants. So what I'm going to say to you is, as you go through these tests, if you feel like the dude in the Yoda pants, it's quite natural. Okay. How are we going to approach this is to show Firstly, the evolution of the Global Appreciation Test in Europe. Explain the adoption of that test into South African law. Maureen will then go through the systematic approach adopted by the courts and the practitioners in Europe in applying the test and using some case examples just to illustrate how it's done. And then we're going to look at the last say let's say well the last decisions of the decisions of the last say, 18 months in South Africa to just show why we are not using the tests go through some of the advantage of using the tests and hopefully by that stage you will have come to where we are is to say it's a good thing to at least pay more attention to and then we're going to show you some uh, websites and information where you can get information quite easily on, on how to use these tests in your day-to-day -day practice. That's what we're going to try and achieve. Um, so let's have a look at the the European Sable versus Puma test. I'm sure it's familiar to absolutely everyone. It it's articulates a so-called global appreciation test and others flow from it. So those uh, cases that are mentioned below are um, should all be familiar. They're certainly quoted in our local decisions and they are the most referenced, referenced European cases on the Global Appreciation Test over the last 20 years by quite some distance. To the extent that if you want to find out the basic principles announced by those cases, they are in every single UK IPO decision, opposition decision. Right, so the adoption of the test of the European test into South African law. Go back to 1984 and we've got the, the test that's uh, set out in Plasco and Evans. Um, and then after the 19... So, so that's 1984, of course, is pre the 1993, the current act. The 1993 act brings our laws closer to the harmonisation direct, uh, directive. And in 1998, uh, there's a reference to Salvo versus Puma. Um, it's been cited 32 times since 2000 and was first mentioned in the Supreme Court of Appeal judgment in Bartolomeu versus Face Fashions, a case that's very familiar to you. And then subsequent decisions um, reference the test, including our very own Yeshimansky versus Brown's The Diamond Store. Um, 
just to show that the principle of the global appreciation test originating out of the European Court of Justice in Solvable versus Punitive was adopted by this court in Barter Limited versus Face Fashion. So it's not just referenced, it's actually adopted. And other courts have used and adopted those decisions that flow from it mentioned in the earlier slide. If we have a look at the relative legislation as to why we adopt this court, what are the wording of the legislation? You've indicated on the left is the UK Trademarks Act Section 5 and the South African Equivalent Section 1014. And if we take that away, we see the similar wording. Identical, similar, likelihood of confusion resonates throughout. And the, the interesting of this uh, aspect of this slide is that you'll see when we approach the European test, we talk about identity, similarity, and likelihood of confusion, which is a little bit absent when we look at the South African approach to the test. Similar provisions, of course, in Article 8 of the European Union, Section 10 and Section 34 of the Trademark Act. I don't think that's non-contentious. I'd, I'd imagine that that everyone, we're at least on the same page so far. At this stage, I'm just going to hand over to Maureen to explain how the European courts approach the global appreciation test. Thanks, Darren. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, right. So the likelihood of confusion test um, can really be applied by looking at five main factors. One, you look at a comparison of your trademarks, then you look at the comparison of your goods and services, the strength of the earlier trademark, look at the nature of the consumer and the purchasing act, and then you conduct a global assessment of all those above factors. So I'd like to take uh, you through to each and every factor just to see exactly how it is applied in practice um, in order to determine similarity. Starting off with the comparison of trademarks. This involves looking at the marks to determine if they are similar phonetically, visually, conceptually. Bearing in mind that the marks are viewed as a whole and taking into account the distinctive and dominant components. The dominant component really is determined by the visual aspect of, of looking at the marks. Now the conclusion to be reached here is not whether the marks are confusingly similar, but actually whether they're just similar. And this means that one must actually go through and check to what degree is their similarity? Is it to a low, me a low degree, medium degree, or a high degree? You will recall that um, in the case of new media versus eating our web services, it was stated as follows. If the goods or services of the parties are so dissimilar to each other, there is no likelihood of confusion. The use of a mark which is identical to the applicant's mark will not constitute an infringement. Furthermore, if the marks are sufficiently dissimilar to each other, no amount of similarity between the goods or services will suffice to bring an infringement. So ultimately, if you find that this, uh, the trademarks are dissimilar, there can be no likelihood of confusion, your test ends there. Um, as Darren mentioned with the early example, Am uh, Monster versus Amazon Monster Pops, if the marks are, are different, there can be no likelihood of confusion, your test ends there, there's no need to go any further. Then secondly, we will look at the comparison of goods. <laughs> right, so this, the, um, the test here should, should be very familiar from British Sugar. You look at the respective users of the goods and services, the users, the physical nature of the goods and services, the trade channels in which they reach the market, if the goods can be found on the same shelf, um, and if they're self-server con consumer items, or if they're competitive, you look at the market research companies and how they would put the goods and services together if they put them in the same or different sectors. Just like as you did with your comparing your trademarks, if you find that the goods and services are dissimilar, the test ends there, there can be no likelihood of confusion. Then we move on to the strength of the earlier trademark. This involves determining the strength of the earlier trademark relied upon because of its inherent, inherent distinctive character or as a result of the use of the trademark, in other words, its reputation. Now this analysis should conclude that the more distinctive the earlier trademark, the, um, the greater the likelihood of confusion, and, uh, uh, simply because wider protection is given to stronger trademarks. In the same breath, if you have a weaker trademark, then the less likely there will be likelihood of confusion. 
but this also means that where a trademark is registered, evidence of use of that trademark should be considered in order to determine if the trademark is a strong trademark. Right, then we move on to the nature of the consumer. So we know that the average consumer is a reasonably circumspect person who um, is reasonably um, observant and circumspect and who does not consider the marks side by side but who suffers from a degree of imperfect recollection. However, one must really decide what type of consumer they're dealing with. Are you dealing with an actual average consumer or perhaps a less sophisticated person or perhaps it could be a more discerning consumer? This is of utmost importance in a country like South Africa which is so diverse you could be dealing with absolutely anybody. So these factors will actually influence whether there is a likelihood of, of confusion. Then we move on to the global assessment. Now this is the wrapped up version where the court has to take into account all those factors to determine if there is a likelihood of confusion. So this test requires one to appreciate that a low degree of similarity between the marks may be offset by a high degree of similarity between the goods and vice versa. Any other aspects to consider would be whether there's evidence of actual confusion or perhaps previous decisions that may, that may influence your likelihood of confusion. Right, so the key aspect that I'm trying to drive here is that these aspects are all dealt with systematically, step by step, there is no conflation in separate parts, you go through each one systematically, it will help you to get to, to, to the correct conclusion and to determine if there is a likelihood of confusion which is currently the issues that we've been experiencing in, in our South African judgments, and Darren will take us through that shortly. But before he does, I'd like to just go through, as he mentioned, two cases. One is from the UK IPO, and the other is from the European Union, European Trademark um, Office, and just to see how they've actually applied this test. Um, if you'll please page with me um, on your handouts to page one. That'll be the Claire Harrison versus Miss Ashley Means case, which is a UK judgment. So if we start from page one, in this case, um, the trademark applicant had applied for the trademark simply, which is in blue, it's the white writing. The trademark was um, published for opposition purposes. The trademark opponent opposed the trademark based on their simply best trademarks. These were all filed for and registered in class 20, covering mattresses, best furniture, etc. So we'll see on page one that the, the, the court um, clearly starts off by highlighting the background to the case and then moves on on page two to give a brief summary of the merits of the case. Um, that, that goes on page two. And then also, as moving on, indicates the evidence that each party filed, because both parties had to file um, evidence. And then on page five, goes through to the decision. And you'll see on the page where the decision starts, the court initially highlights the, the, the grounds that are relied on, the, the trademark law that is relied on, and then the next page on page six goes on to the likelihood of confusion test. Now here they actually highlight and list all the factors to be considered when determining the likelihood of confusion, which is highlighted there for, you, for your convenience. Then once they've listed all these factors, they go into each and every one of those factors and come to a conclusion. And in this case, which is quite nice, at the end of the conclusion, they've highlighted, they've put it in bold to determine what the court actually, come, what conclusion the court comes to. So here they start off with the average consumer, and you'll see on page seven at the top, they briefly state, the average consumer will, in my view, be likely to pay at least a medium degree of attention to the selection of the goods at issue. Moving on, go to the comparison of the goods. They go through the, the British sugar um, factors and come to the conclusion the opponent's specification clearly encompasses that of the applicant and so the goods of the two parties are identical. Carrying on, comparison of the trademarks. Put the two trademarks together and come to a conclusion. Overall, the opponent's mark boom must be considered to be highly similar to that of the applicant, whilst this mark must be considered to be similar to at least a medium degree. So they give the degrees of similarity as well. They then go on to the, the, the strength of the earlier trademark, and on page 9 come to a conclusion. The opponent's marks are inherently distinctive to a low degree. The opponent has shown use of its mark, but it is not sufficient for it to benefit from the enhanced distinctiveness. <coughs> Once they've gone through all of those factors, they come to the likelihood of confusion, the global assessment, and before they even give us a, a conclusion, they quickly remind us as to what factors were needed, what factors were considered to, in, to get to this conclusion, and then um, ultimately on page nine, 
the opposition under this section, which is section 5.2 in this instance, must succeed, or therefore succeeds in full. So that's just briefly how they've gone through systematically from beginning to end to just put, get the train of thought going and for people to understand exactly how they got to the conclusion. And I'd like to then go through to the next one, which is the Kabushiki Kaisha Yakult case. Right, so this case the marks were identical. The trademark applicant was applying for the trademark Yakult in respect of class 11 goods, which is on page 14 at the bottom, you'll see the goods there. The um, trademark opponent had registered the trademark in respect of class 29 milk products, and they have various registrations there on page 14, but these are all for identical trademarks. So the court then starts off um, looking at the likelihood of confusion. Brief summary of how to, to determine likelihood of confusion. They highlight all the factors to be considered, and then they come and they go and um, look at the goods and come to a conclusion that the class, le class 11 is, um, goods are completely dissimilar to all of the opponent's goods included in the early trademarks. On the next page, they come to a simple and quick conclusion, which I'll briefly summarize as follows. Since the goods and services are clearly dissimilar, one of the necessary conditions of Article 8 of the EU TMR is not fulfilled, and the opposition must be rejected. The findings would still be valid even if the earlier trademark were to be considered as enjoying a high degree of distinctiveness. Given that the dissimilarity of the goods and services cannot be overcome by the highly distinctive character of the earlier trademark, the evidence submitted by the opponent in this respect does not alter the outcome reached. So, simply as we mentioned earlier, if you find that your goods and services are dissimilar, you, cannot, you do not proceed with the, with the test because really there is no likelihood of confusion. So Darren will just quickly then take us through the South African decision to see that the differences and how they've approached the likelihood of confusion test. Right, hopefully on that point we can just get from the European decisions, you can see a very systematic approach. I don't think we always follow the systematic approach. In fact, I think we rarely fo follow a systematic approach. There are various advantages to the systematic approach. The other thing I'd, I would say is that we don't look at the strength of the mark. And I'll, I'll show that in a second. So let's just go through the South African approach. now. <coughs> I went through SAFLI, which is really our only online database, came across 11 cases over the last 18 months. Um, only five of those really deal with the likelihood of confusion test. And you can immediately see, you see the dearth of decision making in South Africa relative to Europe. Europe, we're already in 4,012 a day. Okay, so, you know, we, to, to reinvent the wheel from South Africa, I don't think is wise for many reasons that are quite apart from what I'm talking about now. The urban case, um, what I'm going to do rather than laboriously go through the, the, the decisions, I'm just going to highlight specific paragraphs in the decisions, either at the beginning or the end, to look at the wording and try and analyze some of the conflation of the tests and some of the pitfalls that are happening in our decision making process. So if you just bear with me, let's go through. Um, on page 22, paragraph 14. Uh, here I'm going to just skip, it's, it's the green section, it's been highlighted. The first part is pretty okay, he's articulating, or she's articulating, I'm not quite certain, exactly how to plead the section 341B, which is equivalent to the section 1014 case. Uh, the trademark registrations for urban degree, these are the Hilton Weiner uh, trademarks that you'll be familiar with. The unauthorized use by the respondents in the course of trade of the trademark urban degree or a mark so nearly resembling the registered trademark. And this is where the problem, paragraph five, or numbered paragraph five, in relation to goods or services so nearly resembling the goods or services in relation to which the urban degree is used, okay? That wording does not exist in the act, right? It relates to the trademark, not the goods and services. A basic mistake, but can have quite fundamental differences when we're talking about the application of the test. Right, so moving swiftly on to the conclusion of this particular case uh, on page uh, 28, paragraph 34. Again, highlighted in green. I will read this um, <coughs> just because it shows conflation so, and incorrect use of the language and, and the test, really. In short, once a comparison is made between the urban degree symbol, that little symbol at the top there, an urban degree in respect of clothing of the same kind. 
right? Clothing of the same kind doesn't sound that familiar. Is it identical or similar? Then in my view, similarity is sufficient to cause members of the consumer public seeking to purchase within the same product market. That's not relevant at all, same product market. We're talking about whether the goods are similar or identical. We're not talking about competing products. We're not talking about whether they're in the same market, although it may be relevant. The conclusion you've got to reach is whether it's similar or identical or not similar at all. Clearly, by bearing the two competing trademarks, the trademarks do not have to be in competition. Right? We also know that. So conflating really or bringing into account unlawful competition elements into a trademark infringement example, it's irrelevant if the competing tra trademarks are in competition. Certainly at a lower level of interrogation, what is he meaning by a lower level of interrogation? Again, the wording is not clear, it's irrelevant. There is a clear likelihood of confusion because members of the public seeking goods in the same product market, again, we don't have to look at the same product market, will be caused to wonder if the goods have a common origin and then cites a case, right? So you can see the wording there is different from the wording that's used in the UK examples and different from the test as is articulated in section 10. Right, so move on. Let's have a look at Pepsi, Pepsi twist cases, which is, of course is one of our cases. In fact, this case is particularly well organized, easy to read, and often and probably particularly well pleaded by Kelly and the, and, and the crew. Where I have a difficulty with this case is in paragraph 25. Uh, if you look at that on page 38, and here in paragraph 25, 26, 27, and 28, they talk about the reputation in the Pepsi mark. So just to bear, remind you of the facts, here we've got Twist, owned by the Coca-Cola company or subsidiary of them, versus Pepsi Twist, the application. And the argument is that because Pepsi is so well known, people will focus on Pepsi and not be confused between the two, and the judge is trying to decide whether the reputation of Pepsi should be considered at all. The European cases are very clear on this point. The only reputation that you consider is the earlier mark, twist. The reputation of Pepsi is irrelevant in the comparison of the trademarks under the Global Appreciation Test as applied in Europe. So for the next two or three paragraphs, he says he wasn't addressed by counsel on the point and then proceeds to analyze it as if twist, the reputation of twist and Pepsi should be taken into account and whether the a reputation should not be taken into account on both accounts, he gets it wrong. And what I'm saying here is that really just a quick look up north would have eradicated this particular problem. It doesn't change the decision, it's just how they got there. <coughs> on that particular case, I'm also gonna refer just finally to paragraph 32, Median. It's a reference to the Median case. Now this case, in my view, should have been pleaded right up front. Well, it should have been the main case that dealt with the decision. Certainly if it was in Europe, it would have been the defining case. And the question is, where you've got a composite mark, like Pepsi Twist, that takes into account a component within a registered mark, the question of whether there's a likelihood of confusion depends on whether Twist retains an independent distinctive role within the composite mark. If it does, there's a likelihood of confusion. And that's settled law in Europe. So where it's lost, like treat and theatre, where you've got an earlier mark, let's say treat, and you have theatre, it's wholly contained, but it's actually lost within the mark, it doesn't retain an independent distinctive character, it's lost, it's not, that, that's an indication of where it's lost. Where it retains, and the wording is very important, retains an independent distinctive role, you've got com likelihood of confusion. It's as simple as that. In that case, it was Thompson Life versus Life, and that's where they got that. A very talked about case. This is not a hidden case. This is a case that's been mentioned in every single judgment of the UK IPO. And just by the by, Kelly understand, this is not a criticism, not Kelly understand, knew this, wanted to use the test, and really had to struggle to get the advocates to listen to her. And this is another difficulty we have is that where we plead it here in our own firm and we get to the advocates when they write their heads of, heads of argument, we've got to deal with the, we've got to try and get our view into those judgments if you know better. The advocates do not always know better. 
The final, or well, the next one is uh, e travels versus Amadeus. Now, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because it's a shocking judgment. It's an opposition referred to the High Court, which is what we're doing now, dealt with by an acting judge, and he really makes a mess. So, it's it's six pages. It deals with section 10, 12, section 10, 14, and section 10, 17. Just the length of the judgment is indicative of, of, of the difficulties the guy has. And he makes, I mean, paragraph 11 on page 43, I'll just very quickly read to you. Um, he also goes into his own opinion here. He, he talks about it's also quite significant that the trademark of the first, respond, first respondent wants to register uses the letter A and then E travel management. The question I asked myself was why? not did the first respondent in order to distinguish itself properly from the trademark of the applicant and to prevent confusion use the word amadeus e-travel management or something similar well the mark is what he chose <laughs> and the question you know so again just a random statement by judge who really has never dealt quite obviously with any of these decision uh, um, tests um, the next case is Big Boy Scooters, uh, just to show you again on page 48, the bottom of page 48, here we got a comparison of mark CGL, so the, the, the registered trademark is, uh, bear with me a second, is CGL125, and in this particular paragraph, there are various trademarks used by Big Boy. One of them was CCL. So is CGL too close to CCL? He says, with regards to marks commencing with CCL, I do not see them as encroaching on the applicant's trademark. Again, this idea of encroachment seems weird. In my view, there cannot be a situation where the applicant now wants to have a monopoly over the alphabet. Again, this is irrelevant, as we all know. This would be the result if I order the respondent can, cannot use other letters of the alphabet as found in the CCL mark for its goods. The applicant's contention is similar to that, and et cetera, must fail. Okay, so wording creeping in very easily into our adoption of a test that's not structured. The one thing you'll note from all of these judgments, they are not structured, they do not use headings, they do not make separate findings relating to each part of the test. And this is where I see the risk of downfall and the decision making occurring. If you look again on that judgment um, page, uh, the next page, um, paragraph 42 on, on the overleaf, paragraph 40, 43, I'm, I'm not going to read it, but what he does here is when he looks at 341C, and in our act we actually talk about similar goods services in 341C, and he makes a conclusion there that the goods or services are not similar or that the marks are not similar which is you can't have that finding if you've already found there to be confusion under section 341a but it's just an illogical comparison again wouldn't have been made had the tests been followed but we're not looking at 341c at this stage the final case um, is dinner mates um, this is the pepper dew uh, the pepper dew case um, and again, I'm just going to Pepper Mates versus Pepper Dew. Uh, turn to paragraph uh, 23, paragraph page 57, and I'll just quickly read again to illustrate the point. A purely verbal comparison is not enough. Well, we know that. It's quite clear from all the tests. This is, a, by the way, a summarizing paragraph of his entire judgment. The court must transport itself into the market try place to try and visualize how customers of the goods in relation to which the marks are used would react. Applying the test in Plascon Evans, which has been followed in a number of decisions by this court, the marks are visually, phonetically, and conceptually dissimilar. The logic doesn't work. There's a conflation of issues here. He's applying the test, the global appreciation test, and then coming to the conclusion that the marks are visually, phonetically and conceptually similar, where what he should be doing is analyzing whether the marks are visually, phonetically, and conceptually similar, quite apart from the test, and then bringing it into the test when you wrap it all up as a global appreciation. So he's just skipped it around. And why it doesn't make sense is that, the, look, the decision may well be right. The, the ultimate decision is a different story. It's how we get there that I'm interested in. 
If you come to a conclusion, as Maureen pointed out earlier, that the marks are visually, conceptually, and orally, phonetically dissimilar, the test stops there. It, there cannot be a likelihood of confusion. And I'm sure if we look at this and you say pepper mate and pepper dew, I think, well, I'd like to think that people in this room would look at that and say there's a degree of similarity. There's a degree of similarity because they both include the word pepper, they're one word, they've got similar, they, they, there's a visual likeness between them. It may not be particularly high, but you'll come to the conclusion if you go through the step-by-step -step approach that there's a degree of similarity. The question then is, is that a sufficient degree of similarity taking into account the nature of the marks, the nature of the, the distinctive components, pepper being related to the goods, etc., sufficient to cause a likelihood of confusion? That's the English approach, or the European approach. Okay, so hopefully I've got my point across. It is very frustrating going through South African decisions because one doesn't know how to appeal them. You have to appeal the whole decision. Uh, Nick Rosny is in our group made the point, it's like going into a bar and arguing with drunks on a particular bait or debating something with drunks. You just get different opinions. But it's difficult to follow a rational thought process and logic to coming to a conclusion. Right, so going back to the legislation, as we know, that slide's familiar. Let's have a look at the wording used by our South African courts. Very different wording, just to emphasize the point. So nearly resembling clothing of the same kind, same product market, wants a monopoly over the alphabet, encroaching on the applicant's trademark, conceptual provenance as used in twist. All really irrelevant wording relative to the real questions. Are they similar goods? Are they similar? Are they identical? Is there likely confusion? And in not any of these cases, apart from Pepsi, the twist case, did they look at the strength of any of the marks in the global appreciation test. And that is often missing, and I, I must ask a question to you, how often you plead evidence in your citations to argue that there is a greater degree of likelihood of confusion or not when looking at section 1014, not section 1017 and not section 1012. Right, so common mistakes, conflation of the elements under the test, failure to analyze each element, a misuse of the phrase confusingly similar. When you're looking at the similar similarity of the marks taken into account oral, conceptual, visual, that's not confusing similarity. You're just looking for similarity. The confusing aspect is when you take into account your analysis or your conclusion with the goods and services, the strength of the mark, the nature of the consumer and the purchase and decision, wrap it all up, that's confusing similarity. Because confusing similarity is not a phrase that exists in the act, it's a shorthand version for the global appreciation test. Inaccurate of use of wording often leading to, to confusion as to meaning, we've seen that. No analysis of the strength of the earlier trademark and no reference to European decision on, that, on the exact same point. Sorry, I'll put it differently. There is often a reference to the European decision, but it's purely lip, lip service. It's actually not used in, in the application of the test. So, Maureen, I'll just... So, um, the advantages really that I have come to pick up, you know, through practice is that of applying the likelihood of confusion test is that there's a systematic approach which reduces mistakes and oversights, especially in search reports, in submissions to the registry. It makes uh, constructing arguments easier and makes it more simple for the person who's reading to understand where, where you're going. And furthermore, there's a vast database of decisions that are easy to search, which we'll show you in a moment. Um, and these databases are also so great because if you have clients, especially international clients, who have similar cases abroad, it's easy to just go and have a look to see what are the decisions, how do the judges decide on those matters, and how you can incorporate that in your arguments, in, in, in your local decision, um, matters. It's also easier to guide the judge or the adjudicator as to one train of thought. Easier to appeal, as Darren says, reduces costs and narrows the issues. 
It's also easy to teach others Canada attorneys coming in. It's easy for them to understand trademark law if you can give them a systematic way of approaching things. And also caters for South Africa's diversity. We're dealing with 11 official language languages, the countries you're dealing with so many different types of consumers, so it really it assists in, in getting to the correct decision and conclusion. <coughs> right. right, I think just one thing here is you see the judges making the mistakes, and you say, well, what can we do to, we can often determine what they're going to say in their judgments, and I think we can. We can influence it. So if you can structure your submissions, your arguments, your pleadings in a particular way. You guide the judge. You guide the advocate. When the advocate gives you their heads of argument, bring them in line with the decision making. And in that way, you'll find that judges will hopefully adopt the same kind of wording into their decision making processes. Of course, there has been training now at the judges and etc. There's been a lot of debate on that. But I would suggest, and as was suggested when we first gave this discussion that that's where it must start. It actually needs to start with us in adopting a more systematic approach if you're all in agreement as to the advantages of it. Uh, it can have a significant influence on the level of decision making happening in South Africa. So where do you need to go to get help? I mean, where, where do you go, right? First of all, the, a fantastic source of, of information is the UK IP office. You can search trademark decisions. They look like that. You can search particular areas of law, um, and you can get. They're all published. The 340 cases published just in one year. They're, they're all set out in the same way, and um, even if you just read them, because when you read them, you also pick up various ways of phrasing arguments that are in your head, which are very useful. The EU trademark office has a very similar type of case search. Their guidelines for the application of the test are pretty comprehensive, but they are really, really good. So the EU guidelines, the EU trademark manual, has a fantastic, pretty comprehensive piece on how to assess similarity of marks. For example, what happens if there's a, a visual element in one mark and a word element in another mark? How do you look at comparison? How do you make the comparison there? How relevant is the phonetic comparison relative to the visual comparison? How relevant is the conceptual comparison? What happens if one part of the word has got to mean something and the other part doesn't? Do you Is that part of the conceptual comparison? Do you take into the dominant components? What is dominance? Is it only visual dominance or is it other sense of dominance within the mark? How relevant is it if it's distinctive within the mark? What are we talking about? So if you want a real deeper dive into the, the tests that are actually used, that is an excellent source. It's online and you can just go through it. It's not, uh, I would say that it's lovely bedtime reading, but you'll fall asleep in two seconds. So the other way of doing it is to read the cases. And that's much more exciting and invigorating and you, you learn in the same way. So that's what I would, I would recommend. Um, Darts IP is also a very underused resource. We have a, a access to Darts IP. They contain a database of three million decisions and they also deep dive into really minutia of, of the test. So if you're wanting to know whether clothing is similar to um, cosmetics, you don't have to go back to Danko, which is some very ancient decision. You can see contemporary decisions on whether clothing and, and, and cosmetics are similar. And it's very similar. Uh, sorry, it's very useful, especially if you're against an opponent. If you've got a case that supports your point, there's a dearth of cases in South Africa. If you're ahead of that person on the other side with a case, you've got an advantage. So I'd encourage more use of that. Gary Cook, the chap at the bottom, says we don't use it enough. And I, I probably think I agree. And then, to get rid of your incredibly sexy Yoda pants, um, Lita runs a, <coughs> organizes a Santon case discussion, which we have, we've done most of the South African cases. We are going to be subject to your own commitments and whether you can, but you're very welcome to just dial in or join us for VCR. We're going to spend half an hour every Thursday going through.